Welcome again everyone to Art Appreciation. We're looking at chapter two this time, uh, which focuses on the elements of art and principles of organization. Uh, a little reminder, uh, please remember that these lectures and PowerPoints are meant to supplement and enhance your understanding of the material contained in your textbook. So please make sure that you're reading your textbooks carefully and thoughtfully as it will include additional information relative to this subject. So we're looking at the elements of art and principles of organization today. And um, these are the things that are used to create a work of art. So whether you're creating a sculpture or a water fountain, um, you're using the elements of art and the principles of organization. And the way you use those elements uh, and principles can really help define a feeling or an idea for the artist, as we will see. First off, we want to look at three basic levels of representation. There's naturalistic, which is a complete adherence to nature, as you see in the sculpture and the painting on the left. Then we have abstraction, uh, which is uh, some adherence to nature, such as the sculpture and the painting in the middle. Uh, but it's been simplified, flattened, or distorted. And then third uh, level of representation is non-objective uh, on the far right. And we see with the painting and the sculpture, there's no attempt to recreate nature. It's just lines and shapes in space. So beginning with the elements of art, we start with line. Line is the path of a moving point as it moves across a plane. Those lines are either actual or implied, and that is further explained in your textbook. Uh, we want to look first at line types. Uh, there are four basic types of lines. There's vertical lines, there's horizontal lines, there's curving lines, and diagonal lines. Vertical lines talk about potential action, horizontal lines talk about no action, and curving and diagonal lines talk about, di about action. So looking on your left, you see one drawing that is full of curves and diagonals, uh, which implies a lot of action and movement. And on the right, you see a work of art that has simply horizontal lines, which creates a sense of calm. So immediately you should be able to see that whether you're using curving lines or uh, horizontal lines, those type of lines can influence the emotion behind the work. Another way to influence the motion with line is to look at line quality. And for example, on the left, the very heavy, aggressive lines uh, suggest anger, whereas the very melodic and flowing lines on the right suggest happiness or joy. So again, the, the elements, the way they are used, can impact the emotional reading of the work you're looking at. Our next element is value. Value is the relative degree of lightness or darkness. And these uh, degrees of lightness and darkness, from your lightest light to your darkest darks, create the illusion of volume on a flat surface. So you see in the image a sphere and the different levels of light that occur uh, to create the illusion of depth uh, through charcoal. Chiaroscuro is another uh, version of value, the use of light and dark to create the illusion of form. And in the images below, you see that um, the form is created through the interplay of light and shadow. This is again called chiaroscuro, which is Italian for chiaro, light, and scuro, dark. So again, that interplay of light and shadow creates the illusion of form. Okay, our next element to look at is color. And color is a visual response to differing wavelengths of sunlight. We start with what is called an achromatic palette, 
which is just black, white, and gray. Black and white are considered neutrals. And so A against chroma, color, uh, this is a neutral palette, an achromatic black and white and gray palette, achromatic. With color, there are what is known as restricted palettes. And um, as you can see, monochroma means one color. So monochromatic is one color, plus its tints and shades. If you look at the upper left, the orange image, you see um, a high intensity orange with a low intensity orange that's been mixed with white. That's called a tint and another low intensity orange that's been mixed with black or gray, that's called a shade. So a monochromatic uh, image or object is one color plus its tints and shades. Uh, to the right you see a complementary palette, that's a two color palette. Two colors opposite each other on the color wheel. Uh, because they are opposite, uh, they create a lot of visual tension such as in this image, purple and yellow. Uh, as opposed to the monochromatic, which is one color, is non-oppositional and creates calm. The complementary palette creates visual excitement uh, by its opposition. Below you, th you see three examples of three color palettes. On the left is the triadic palette, these are colors equidistant on the color wheel, such as red, yellow, and blue. Analogous colors are three colors that touch or are side by side each other on the color wheel, such as blue, purple, and green. And then tricolor are two colors that are next to each other on the color wheel and one color opposite. So you see with this cake, you have green and yellow that sit next to each other, and then pink, which is a tinted red, uh, that's opposite. Now, of these three palettes, uh, these three three-color palettes, the analogous palette, because they sit next to each other, create no opposition and creates a sense of calm. Whereas the triadic palette and the tricolor palette, because of their use of opposition, creates excitement. So let's take a step back and think for a second. If I wanted to paint a painting that uh, encouraged visual calm, I might choose the monochromatic palette or the analogous palette. If I wanted to uh, create a painting that uh, encouraged excitement or, or even anxiety, I might use the triadic, the complementary, or the tricolor palette. Again, it's the choices that the artist makes can encourage either a sense of calm or a sense of excitement. Another co color palette is called polychromatic. Poly, many, chroma, color. A polychromatic uh, palette is four or more colors. So while all the restricted palettes that we just saw are three or less color, the open palette is four or more. And so you obviously can see with a four color or polychromatic palette, there is just a lot of visual stimulation and visual excitement that occurs. Two other types of palettes are what are known as natural and arbitrary. On the left, you see a naturalistic color palette, which attempts to recreate nature as we see it. So the blue sky, the green fields, and the red flowers. Whereas on the right, you see um, an arbitrary palette, which uh, does not attempt to recreate nature as we see. So in this, this, in this image, we see pink sky, red water, green buildings. Again, it goes against our understanding of how we see color in nature. Uh, if you think about it, which palette creates a sense of calm and which palette creates a sense of visual excitement? Obviously on the left, the naturalistic palette creates a sense of calm because it's how we are used to seeing. Whereas on the right, it creates visual stimulation because it is an invented form of vision. 
We also have warm and cool palettes. On the left, you see the cool blue, which can suggest the sense of calm. And on the right, you see the bright, warm palette, which can create a sense of warmth or action or uh, love or anger. Um, however, the uh, artist wants to convey the emotion through color. Our next element we want to look at is shape. And there are two basic shapes that we want to uh, talk about today, and it is the geometric shape and the organic or biomorphic shape. The geometric shape uses um, straight edge or evenly curving lines, whereas the organic or biomorphic shapes um, create an irregular shape uh, that uses uneven curves. So on the left, with the geometric shapes, the rectangles we see and the squares, this uh, form of geometry creates a great sense of calm. So geometric shapes create order and stability. Whereas on the right, uh, organic or biomorphic shapes create a sense of instability or excitement. So again, the type of shapes you use can influence the emotional reading of a work of art. Okay, we have uh, next, our element is texture. Texture is the surface character of a material experienced through touch or the illusion of touch. And so on the left, uh, with this photograph, you see uh, a representation of actual tree bark, which would be called tactile or real texture, whereas on the right, we have what is known as, we have the image of bark again, but it's a painting, and so the texture that's created is visual. If you were to actually touch the painting, it would be flat. And uh, when you're talking about visual texture, you have to look at three basic types of texture. And again, this is very much like the three different levels of representation that we talked about earlier. Simulated texture attempts to recreate texture uh, in a strict adherence to nature. Abstracted texture is texture that somewhat mimics uh, how we see in nature, but it's been simplified or flattened in some way. And invented texture is texture that doesn't relate to nature at all. We can also look at the element of pattern, and there are two basic types of pattern. There is geometric patterning on your left and naturalistic patterning on your right, okay? And again, if you look at this, you see on the left the, the geometry, uh, the geometric pattern created through the uh, equal sequencing of small rectangles creates a sense of order and stability. Whereas the organic shape, uh, shapes on the right create a sense of visual instability and excitement. So again, the type of the way you use the elements in a work of art can profoundly affect the emotional impact of that piece. Lastly, with elements, we want to talk about the nature of space. Uh, with space, there is either actual space or volume or the illusion of space. And in the illusion of space, as such is represented with these three paintings below, we have three basic types. We have atmospheric on your lower left, which shows both a foreground, a middle ground, and a background, with things getting smaller and less distinct as they move back. On the right, above, you see linear perspective, with lines converging to a single point in the center of the image. And on the uh, upper left, you see isometric perspective, which uses parallel lines to create a sense of space. All these three perspectives are, are um, illusions. So if you see a sense of space in an image, chances are one of these three uh, perspectives is being used. We now want to look at the principles of organization. 
And um, the principles of organization refer to the way in which the elements are organized in a work of art. Again, composition. Our first uh, principle we want to consider is balance. Balance is a sense of equilibrium between areas of implied weight, attention, attraction, or moments of force. And uh, for our purposes, there are four basic types of balance that we consider. Uh, on the far right, we see symmetry, which is if you divide the image down the center, what's happening on the left is perfectly happening on the right without any deviation. In the lower left, radial symmetry is it were it um, spreads out from the center evenly and without uh, derivation or change. So radial symmetry and symmetry are about things staying the same, things remaining the same, uh, and they both create symmetry and asymmetry, uh, symmetry and radial symmetry, a profound sense of calm. Uh, in the center, you see what is known as approximate symmetry, which uh, means it looks like it's centered and the same, but if you look closer, what's happening on the left isn't exactly happening on the right. And so um, this creates a more informal sense of balance, which uh, is less formal than symmetry, but doesn't go to the, to the farther end of asymmetry which we see on the upper left. Uh, asymmetry, if you draw a dividing line down the center of the image, you see no uh, balance between the two sides. So with this image, you can see that the weight of this image is on the left half versus on the right, it's very uh, open and free. So this imbalance creates a sense of excitement or anxiety, however you want to uh, think about it. Our next principle to look at is rhythm. Rhythm is about anything that repeats. If you see anything repeating in an image, you have rhythm. And so below we see lines and shapes uh, and lines again repeating, but they repeat in a different way. Uh, we have regular, alternating, and eccentric. Regular rhythm, such as the top left image, uh, creates a sense of calm, order, reasonability, and rationality. It is stable because it does not change, it stays the same. On the right, you see alternating, so it changes, but it changes in a regular way. So that's called alternating. That kind of combines both a sense of stability and changeability or instability at the same time. And then in the lower left, you see um, eccentric rhythm where it's changing with each repetition. So this type of rhythm creates visual excitement and energy, instability, and even anxiety. Our next principle is proportion and scale, the comparative relationship of size between parts of a whole or its scale to nature. In the top two images, we see a sculpture on the left and a painting on the right where the size between the parts of the whole matter. So for example, um, on the left you see a um, baby pen, which is normally very small, that's been blown up into a sculpture to be larger than life. So the fact that um, the size has changed relative to our experience of it makes it an image that, or a sculpture that is interesting to look at. On the right, we see four figures, the Madonna and child and two angels. We see that those angels are less important of the four because they are smaller. And then lastly, with scale to nature, we look at the painting below and we see four figures again uh, at a riverbank enjoying a lunch. 
And if you look at the woman in the back, she should be a lot smaller based on the principle of or the element of atmospheric perspective. She should be much smaller to fit into the space. So her importance in the image is enhanced because she is rendered larger than life, larger than she should be. So scale can change our experience of how we feel about something or think about something. Another principle to look at is emphasis. Elements assuming more importance, often through scale or placement, isolation, direction, or character. On the left, you see that the face of the individual is more important because more material and attention has been added to it. So our eyes tend to focus on that part of the drawing because of its emphasis. On the right, the large blue uh, shape becomes a focal point because of its size and where it's placed uh, in the image. It is the thing that our eye uh, constantly returns to. So when you're thinking about emphasis or point of focus, uh, you want to ask yourself where does your eye always end up? And that usually is because the artist has intentionally made that the focal point of the image or object. Unity is another principle, and unity uh, is related to anything that repeats or is uh, uh, creates a sense of rhythm or pattern, all right? So repetition, pattern, and rhythm create unity. So in an image, anything you see that repeats, that's creating rhythm. So in all, th or cr that's creating unity. So in all three of these images below, we see a high degree of unity because there's a high degree of repetition. Now, um, we see both uh, regular repetition uh, through the lines in the upper left. We see irregular repetition in the um, lines in the lower left. And we see a combination of regular and irregular uh, repetition with the Marilyn Monroe image. So again, things that occur regularly uh, create a sense of calm and order and reason. And things that are irregular or changing creates a sense of instability. Again, um, these uh, elements and principles that are used by the artist can really uh, influence the way we feel about a work of art. Variety is the kind of the opposite side of unity. Variety focuses on the differences through contrast, opposition, singularity, diverse elements to add uh, individualism and interest. And so you see with these three images below, we see a lot of things changing. Uh, contrast and elaboration is about layering things on top of each other. And you see with the geometric image uh, in the upper left, you see the repetition of circles and squares and triangles. And yet those circles and squares and triangles are changing in terms of scale, in terms of direction, in terms of color. And so um, if you look at this image, you can see both unity in the repetition of these geometric shapes and variety in the fact that all these geometric shapes are changing. And so uh, this chapter two is the basis of uh, the formal evaluation that you will be engaging in, which is an evaluation of a single work of art based on the elements and principles. And one of the first things you want to do uh, with this essay is pick a work of art that you feel comfortable evaluating. Um, in other words, pick a work of art that you can read based on the elements and principles, regardless of whether or not you like it. That doesn't really matter. You want to find uh, an image or an object that has um, at least five of the elements and at least five of the principles for you to discuss. And you can choose 
<clears throat> whatever you want to choose. For example, on the left, we see um, one painting, and on the right, we see another painting. Just looking at the two images, I really encourage you to trust your eye. For example, one of these paintings creates calm and order and reason. It's stable. It doesn't change. Do you know which one I'm talking about? If you think it's the one on the left, you're correct. The painting on the left uh, creates a sense of calm because of the elements and principles that have been employed. For example, uh, the lines are pure verticals and horizontals. Uh, that creates either no action or potential action, which is um, a very calm image. It is a one color monochromatic image, uh, just red with uh, the tints of pink. And again, that monochroma color creates no opposition. Um, the pattern that's created with this image is geometric. It is regular and unchanging. The shapes are also regular shapes, geometric. They do not change in scale or order or repetition. Um, the balance is symmetrical. If you divide it down the middle, what's happening on the left is happening on the right. The rhythm is regular. It is smooth and even. The proportion remains the same throughout. The scale remains the same. There is no single focal point. Uh, it is almost pure unity. So the, uh, whereas unity is emphasized, variety is de-emphasized. So even though this is called a non-objective painting, this is that level of representation that doesn't attempt to cre recreate nature at all. Uh, so we, we can know that even though there is no story being told, we can see that the artist on the left is trying to create an image that is calm and orderly and reasonable just by the elements and principles that are used. On the right, however, we see a painting that is completely opposite. It creates a sense of instability, excitement, irrationality. Uh, it can be both happy or anxiety creating based on how you read it. And uh, these emotions, these heightened emotions, are created primarily uh, through the elements that are chosen and the principles that are used. Again, this is also a non-objective painting on the right, and so it doesn't attempt to adhere to nature, and yet we can still say that this is a visually exciting and stimulating moment that the artist is creating. And how do we know that? Well, the lines are all diagonals and curves, and that creates action. Uh, the color palette is a four-color polychromatic palette with uh, lots of uh, value, dark darks and light lights, uh, high intensity colors such as the yellow and the reds against kind of a lower intensity uh, colors like blue. So this mixing of different colors, both a warm palette and a cool palette, creates again visual excitement. Uh, the pattern is naturalistic meaning irregular elements spaced at irregular intervals. And so that is creating excitement. The shapes are irregular, organic, and biomorphic. So again, it could create either a sense of happiness, excitement, or anxiety, or even fear, based on how you want to read these things. But they don't suggest calm. With the principles, the balance is asymmetry. If you divide a line down the center, what is happening on the left is not happening on the right. Again, that creates instability. The rhythm is eccentric. It is irregular and changing. Uh, the scale is constantly changing. Uh, the focal point is mixed. There's a lot of things that we're looking at at the same time. And unity is de-emphasized, whereas variety, which focuses on the element of difference, change, or uniqueness, uh, reigns supreme. 
So in looking at these two images, you can begin to see how that through the use of the elements and principles, the artist is communicating to his or her audience. And by understanding how the elements and principles can impact a work of art, the audience can be an educated, active listener that understands what the artist is trying to say. So um, please uh, remember, this is just my perspective on the elements and, and principles. This is my point of view. Um, your book contains much more information, more depth in terms of uh, differences and small uh, things to think about when you're looking at the elements and principles. So please read chapter two thoroughly again. You can rewatch this um, PowerPoint as much as you need uh, as a way of beginning to understand how to write an effective formal evaluation that focuses on one work of art and its use of elements and principles. Thank you.